Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Jardin Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui coulent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Les années passent Qu'il est loin, là je tombe Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte Day 979 of the Trump administration The eve of congressional testimony From the acting director of national intelligence And the inspector general And we have brand new revelations About the whistleblower Whose explosive complaint Touched off the impeachment inquiry Now underway The New York Times reports new details About the intel officer Who raised concerns about Trump's phone call With the president of Ukraine The Times reports that the conversation, quote, raised alarms not only about what the two men said in a phone call, but also about how the White House handled records of the conversation, according to two people briefed on the complaint. The whistleblower identified multiple White House officials as witnesses to potential presidential misconduct who could corroborate the complaint, the people said, adding that the inspector general for the intelligence community, Michael Atkinson, interviewed witnesses. Atkinson also found reason to believe that the whistleblower may not support the re-election of Mr. Trump and made clear that the complainant was not in a position to directly listen to the call or to see the memo that reconstructed it before it was made public. Today, the White House released its notes from that call between Trump and the Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, that was made on July 25th, exactly two months ago. The document, which is not a verbatim transcript, but is based off of notes and recollections of a conversation, the document confirms reports that Trump asked for an investigation of Joe Biden and his son. Trump in the conversation reminds Zelensky, quote, we do a lot for Ukraine. We spend a lot of effort and a lot of time. The United States has been very, very good to Ukraine. The response from Zelensky, we are ready to continue to cooperate for the next steps. Specifically, we are almost ready to buy more javelins. That means anti-tank missiles from the United States for defense purposes. Trump continues, I would like you to do us a favor, though. I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. They say crowd strike. I guess you have one of your wealthy people. The server, they say Ukraine has it. He then mentions William Barr. I would like to have the attorney general call you or your people, and I would like you to get to the bottom of it. President Trump then brings up Rudy Giuliani, his personal attorney. Quote, Mr. Giuliani is a highly respected man. I will ask him to call you along with the attorney general. Rudy very much knows what's happening. If you could speak to him, that would be great. There was a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out uh, about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Note that there is no evidence that either Vice President Biden or his son, Hunter, were guilty of any wrongdoing in Ukraine. We also learned tonight that the July call was not the first time the two men had spoken. The New York Times also reports this, quote, When Ukraine elected its new leader on April 21st, Mr. Trump seized on the moment as an opportunity to press his case. Within hours of Mr. Zelensky's victory, Mr. Trump placed a congratulatory call as he was en route from his Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida to Washington. He urged Mr. Zelensky to coordinate with Mr. Giuliani and to pursue investigations of corruption, according to people familiar with the call, the details of which have not previously been reported. Late today, Trump spoke out about the impeachment investigation, his phone call in July, and efforts to make the whistleblower's complaint public. But I've spoken with leader Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans, many of them, and we were going to do this anyway, but I've informed them, all of the House members, that I fully support transparency on the so-called whistleblower information. The witch hunt continues. 
But they're getting hit hard on this witch hunt because when they look at the information, it's a joke. Impeachment for that? And I think you should ask for the first conversation. It was beautiful. It was just a perfect conversation. But I think you should do that. I think you should do. And I think you should ask for VP Pence's conversation. You take a look at that call. It was perfect. I didn't do it. There was no quid pro quo. Democrats saying, listen, we can't beat him at the election, so let's impeach him. The complaint is now in the hands of Congress. This afternoon, at about the same time Trump was speaking, members of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees were able to view the document containing the allegations against Trump. I found the allegations deeply disturbing. I also found them very credible. I can understand why the Inspector General found them credible. I think it's a uh, travesty that this complaint was withheld as long as it was because it was an urgent matter. It is an urgent matter. Democrats ought not to be using the word impeach before they had had the whistleblower complaint or read any of the transcripts. Republicans ought not to be rushing to circle the wagons and say there's no there there when there's obviously lots that's very troubling there. Tonight, 220 members of the House, that is a majority, support some type of action regarding impeachment. Last night at this time, that number was 188. On Monday, it was 147. As we mentioned at the top of the show, acting director of national intelligence Joseph McGuire will appear before Congress tomorrow. He will testify at an open hearing on the whistleblower complaint at 9 a.m. That will be before the House Intelligence Committee. And then at 2 p.m., he and the inspector general, Michael Atkinson, will go before Senate, the Senate Intel Committee in a closed session. It is Thursday, the 6th of September of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. And one other thing, do not discriminate against the grit. The grit is the most discriminated grain in the grain world, and it is so wrong. So very wrong. Don't do it. Okay, well, impeachment is really on the table. At the top, we had a rundown uh, about lawmakers who had seen the whistleblower complaint, who had uh, called it disturbing, credible, and explosive. It has been declassified, though. Is it really declassified? Has it been barred? Of course, Barr is uh, is strongly implicated in this complaint. Yep, Pence is all over it, too. Told you so. That's a trademark. Uh, I have a trademark pending application right now. So just or an application pending is how you would say it. Where am I? Um, Trump is uh, tweeting out in all caps. Sounds scared to me. Very scared. I did not go on to the Facebook community pages this morning because I've been a little busy with some other things. And I'll fill you in on that. Uh, because, uh, and, and so I don't know their responses, but they were strangely quiet all day yesterday, yesterday about impeachment. I did, uh, post a little, I think I mentioned that a little blurb about Greta Thunberg and, uh, some of the usual libertarian Trump bro types, uh, took exception. Prove my point. I, I just I just stated that all the worst men are terribly terrified of Greta. And I was happy about it. I thought I thought it was fun. And uh, yeah, there was a deluge of the worst of the worst. And they let everybody know it, too. Yikes. And the typical libertarian strategy of like, I'm going to write paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs to prove I don't know what. It was a melange of uh, Rand. That'd be Ein. And weird, weird uh, American-style conspiracy theories mixed in. Okay. We have our own Templars here, you know. We don't have to actually cite the Templars to, uh, you know, make 
reasonable people shy away and go, I don't know. Maybe we should just let him stay in the corner by himself now. And uh, without ever mentioning the Templars. So we have our own. And uh, that was displayed tremendously just on the environment. (laughs) So I was waiting to find out what they would. Well, there were a couple who gave the, you know, the party line of, you know, uh, the the election's over. The election is over. You know, well, you just want to you just want to re rehash the election and use the impeachment because you couldn't win. Well, it's not about winning, first of all. And Hillary did get three million plus votes more. So there is that. And I know the Electoral College was manipulated to, in such that the guy won. All he had to do. We'll say, okay, we're never going to let this happen again. I'm sorry. I benefited from this, but I'm going to make sure this never happens again. Never said that. In fact, what did he do? He went and solicited help from as many countries as he could. And Ukraine, I think, is only one. Because you know he's got the Souths in there, too. And maybe who else? Who else could it be? Did he try to broker a deal with the Chinese? And he said, well, listen, we'll give your daughter a bunch of patents. On escort services. And Trump said, okay. So what's going on there? Quid pro quo. (laughs) Yeah, it should be quid pro quo. But uh, this is Trump now. All right. So I think that ultimately the defense for Trump is that, you know, ignorance will be a defense. But never before has ignorance, ignorance of the law been a defense, unless you're a rich, spoiled white guy. A rich, spoiled white guy. Bully. Then you can claim ignorance of the law. But uh, Giuliani... I shall remind folks that Giuliani has been working, his lobby shop has been working the former Soviet bloc really since uh, after 9-11, even maybe even before. But he certainly ramped it up during GW's administration because he could. And then did a lot of uh, in-your-face type of lobbying in the former Eastern bloc during Obama's administration. He's been working this for quite a while. But Barr is all over this. Pence is all over this. Boy, you know what? President Nancy Pelosi sounds pretty damn good. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Help yourself. Well, on the rest of the menu, Oracle says congressional and state investigators have asked it for information about Google. California and 16 other states sued the Trump administration over weakened protections for endangered species. And right after a call for impeachment and right after Mitch McConnell said, oh, yeah, you can look at the whistleblower complaint. In fact, maybe we'll release it and declassify it like they did this morning. <laughs> right after that, the Senate voted to terminate Trump's national emergency for his border wall again. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Afghan women's rights activists fear mandatory poll photos could stop them from voting. And Mexico's Oaxaca state legalizes abortion in an historic move for the Catholic nation. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit.
bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the rightish of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and we thank Kelly for doing so. To the leftish of the page, from the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is our link to our Patreon site. And, uh, boy, <laughs> we've been running for eight years, and about halfway we had to replace the original machinery. You know, we were on a little netbook when we first started broadcasting. Had to beef up that pretty quick. And uh, then, then actually, after the netbook, then we had what we considered to be the original machinery, and that got replaced about halfway through this eight-year stint so far. And uh, I see that the workhorses that have been working like horses for so long since the last time we made that exchange, that changeover, are uh, they're wearing out. And my Mac, the broadcaster, the MacBook, is giving me a bit of problems, darn it. I thought it was just going to be this old Dell PC that I've got that uh, where I do a lot of formatting and other things and searching on the Internet so that the broadcasting machine is dedicated only broadcasting. Well, the broadcasting machine is wearing out. I'm having some sort of degradation. And uh, Tom is out there busy, but uh, we're going to put our heads together and figure this out. But I fear that we're going to have to replace the Mac a lot sooner than we anticipated. And that's where you come in, because even though the bulk of whatever we do here, paying the bills and and everything else, <laughs> comes out of our own wallets, uh, our biggest contributor is you and has been since the very beginning, and we thank you for that. So uh, good thing I've been squirreling away some funds that you've been sending our way. You know, a recurring contribution on Patreon, just uh, an espresso-type coffee drink. The cost of that sent our way once a month really helps us not only pay the bills, but uh, uh, frees up some of the funds that we need to pull out of our pockets to go get this new machinery. Darn it. I was hoping I could limp them along a bit longer. Apparently not. So thank you for your generosity. Uh, And we'll let you know, hopefully ahead of time, when... uh, when things really degra- degrade and and uh, shut off, and then we're like trapped. Hopefully, I have enough warning before that happens, so that we can make an easy transition like we did last time. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so. It is so easy; just go to at Netroots Radio. We do thank Tom for taking care of that. I take care of at Justice Putnam, and I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime, and then get that linked up on social media for your social media pleasure. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West, and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and really wherever podcasts can be found. Wherever. Okay, let's see here. Um, Now, once I uh, put myself in that proverbial bubble where I just have to shut off, you know, possibilities for the curated newsread each day, um, I do know that the DNI has started testifying at the top of David's show. So I have... Somewhat unaware, I can see some things when I'm roaming about, but I pretty much shut it off. I don't, I dare not link up because I don't have time. <laughs> so uh, I do know that the DNI has been testifying. I don't quite know how that's going, but I will find out. The whistleblower, or no, I'm sorry, the IG will be testifying, of course, in closed session, as uh, was specified at the top there by Kornacki. And uh, I guess that would be at 2 p.m. Eastern. So that makes it, uh, what, 11? No, 11 p.m. here on the West Coast. So uh, there is that. And uh, we'll have more on the IG uh, testimony. Hopefully, uh, you know, that would be kind of nice to see something about that in open session. 
I would also say that I am not terribly happy about, oh, we're going to just do the uh, impeachment on the Ukrainian story because there's a little bit more involved in this impeachment proceeding. We don't need to, to impeach him on every single crime. But, you know, a half dozen or, or a little more? <laughs> Please. We're going to throw everything into the Ukraine story so that they can manipulate it? There already are. But there's a lot of obstruction of justice involved in some other aspects, not just the Ukraine issue. So I hope that uh, as these rules are being uh, set down, that uh, that is kept in mind. Also, don't go on recess in two weeks. What the hell? You have an impeachment proceeding to do. I know you need to go home and campaign. Use this aspect as part of your campaign. You know, already... I told you, Trump is already fundraising off of this. Do the work, and you will be rewarded. Okay, let's get into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays by Diane Bartz out of Reuters. Oracle Corp., which has clashed with Alphabet's Google in business disputes, has received requests for information from congressional and state investigators looking into allegations that Google violated antitrust law. Oracle, which is knowledgeable about Google's advertising business, has received information requests from the Texas Attorney General's Office and the House of Representatives Judiciary Committee, said Glenn Gluck, an Oracle executive based in Washington. I should uh, mention real quickly here, just as, I don't know, fairness in, in journalistic practices, I suppose, or being open. Uh, I I did private chef uh, quite a few parties at Larry Ellison's request, oftentimes on uh, the, the more elegant of the yachts in Compass Rose's uh, fleet. <laughs> they had several. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it would, it would have been the Camelot, for those of you who may be uh, familiar with the uh, nautical vessels plying the San Francisco Bay. And also uh, at his place down on the peninsula a few times as well. Really, you know, actually, Ellison is a pretty nice guy, but, uh, you know, to me. <laughs> I, when I first met him, I, you know, sort of vaguely heard of Larry Ellison. I didn't really, you know, I wasn't into the gossip part of all of it. And I just, uh, the first time I ran into him uh, was a company party on the Camelot. And he came into the galley because, you know, people were allowed to roam the boat. And he came into the galley and started talking to me. And I just figured he was just somebody working at Oracle. And he was. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe because I wasn't deferential because I was kind of busy. I was trying to get my job done, too, and, you know, speak with the gas. But uh, he uh, he personally requested that I do quite a few parties for him. And uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, he might be sort of a you know special fellow, kind of greedy. You never know. An iconoclast, at least. OK. So we'll continue here. Uh, the committee will decide whether to issue subpoenas, depending on how many companies answer voluntarily. Some firms feel they are less likely to be retaliated against by the giants if they are compelled to share information, according to the source. Oracle has also met with the Justice Department. Google declined comment on the matter. Oracle has alleged that Google infringed on Oracle's Java copyright to make the Android operating system that runs most of the world's smartphones. The Supreme Court is considering whether to take up Google's appeal of a lower court ruling reviving the lawsuit. Oracle has sought about $9 billion in damages. That's B. Billion with a B. Technology companies once lauded as a source of innovation that spurred efficiency and economic growth face a backlash in the U.S. and the world over concerns among competitors, lawmakers, and consumer groups that the firms 
have too much power and harm users and business rivals. Well, that's the least of it. Nicola Groom, also of Reuters, brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. California and 16 other U.S. states sued the Trump administration over its efforts to weaken protections for endangered species. The suit was filed in federal court in Northern California and announced by Attorney General Xavier Becerra at a wildlife area in Davis, California, which is just due east of San Francisco. I don't think any of us wants a museum to be the only place these children will be able to see a southern sea otter or the desert tortoise, Becerra said. But if we don't act, that's a real possibility. Of course, the people I get confronted with who just don't think there's an environmental concern ever have no problem with getting rid of the southern sea otter and the desert tortoise if it happens to be in their way. The suit, led by California, Maryland, and Massachusetts, comes a month after the U.S. Department of Interior's Fish and Wildlife Service and the Commerce Department's National Marine Fishery Service announced final revisions to the 1970s-era Endangered Species Act. The revisions ended a practice of automatically extending the same protections for endangered species to threatened species. They also prohibit the designation of critical habitat for species threatened by climate change and struck down language that downplayed the economic costs of safeguarding animals. These are long overdue and necessary regulatory changes that will recover more imperiled species facing extinction than previously accomplished over the span of this law. And that was Department of Interior spokesman Nick Goodwin said in an emailed statement, We will see them in court, and we will be steadfast in our implementation of this important act to improve conservation efforts across the country. That's the Interior Department. Conservation of their oil and mineral interests. Gems, too, maybe. California said at the time the revisions were disclosed that it would sue to block them. The administration's rules throw science and data out the window by injecting economic considerations in what would be a science-driven decision, Becerra said. Whether or not an animal should be protected should not be a question of whether it will help or impede corporate profits. Is it too much to keep them alive? Cheaper to kill them. Well, look how we treat our workers. Do you really want a bunch of wild animals collectively bargaining and having some sort of proxy do it for them? Are you kidding me? The weakening of the act's protections is one of the many moves Donald Trump, a Republican, uh, to roll back existing regulations and boost oil, gas, and coal production, as well as grazing, ranching, and logging on federal land. In addition to Massachusetts and Maryland, California is joined in the suit by Connecticut, Colorado, Illinois, Michigan, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, Washington, and the cities of Washington, D.C., and New York, New York.
Dan Desai Martin of Share Blue Media brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A day after the House announced a formal in- impeachment inquiry, well, <laughs> the hits just keep on coming, don't they? Don't they? In a 54 to 41 vote, the Senate supported a resolution to terminate Trump's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. The vote marks the second time in about six months that a bipartisan group of senators rejected Trump's attempt to use the emergency declaration to take money from military families and use it to build his vanity wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. The vote also comes one day after Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced a formal impeachment inquiry into Trump's criminal behavior. Also, right after Mitch said, Yeah, I think that we should all look at that whistleblower complaint. I'm wondering what Mitch's gambit is. Do you think that he's going to try to, you know, slink and lurk in the shadows and sneak away? I wonder. During the 2016 campaign, Trump repeatedly claimed Mexico would pay for a border wall. When that failed to materialize, Trump demanded Congress give him billions of dollars for a wall. After Congress rejected him, Trump declared a national emergency at the border, giving himself the authority to divert money Congress appropriated to the military and use it to build his wall. When Congress voted to to reject the national emergency in March, it was unclear what military projects would see funding taken away and diverted to the wall. Over the summer, the Trump administration announced where the $3.6 billion would come from, including a child care center at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, which currently has regular sewage backups, a new battalion complex and ambulatory care center at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, updates to Fort Huachuca in Arizona, where current working conditions are unsafe for troops, and half a billion dollars for schools on military bases across the country and around the globe, because this guy didn't go to a real military school, but a military-themed school. Even after learning where the money would be taken from, not one single Republican senator changed their vote. Even those Republicans who supported Trump in the past only to find out military projects in their own state will be defunded in order to pay for a border wall. Well, that includes vulnerable Republicans who are facing tough re-election races in 2020. The joint resolution now heads to the House where it will likely pass once again with a bipartisan majority in March. Trump was forced to veto a similar resolution and is expected to do so again unless he's too busy unable to multitask when the law is knocking at the door. Okay, let's get to our break and when we get back from that break we are going to go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Suzanne Bard. Every culture around the world creates music. But what shapes our perception of music? Two candidates are the limits of the human brain and the exposure we've already had to music during our lives. If we only test participants with experience with Western music, then we really can't know whether these features come from the experience or from the biological constraint. Psychologist Nori Jacoby of the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics. During the past few years, he and his colleagues have visited a remote area of Bolivia to investigate this question. And so we traveled there by taking a canoe ride or taking a Cessna plane or a couple of hours on a track to communities that don't have running water or electricity. 
The Chimane are an indigenous people who live in the Amazon basin. We specifically recruited participants from the Bolivian Amazon because these participants have relatively little exposure to Western music. For example, octaves are a staple of Western music, but Chimane musical instruments don't feature them. As an acoustical phenomenon, an octave is defined as the interval in which the vibrational frequency of the bottom note is half that of the top note. They're considered the same note an octave apart. For example, middle C and high C. For the study, Chimane participants were asked to listen to simple melodies and sing them back to the researchers. This exercise revealed that the Chimane don't perceive tones that are an octave apart as the same note. On the other hand, participants from the U.S. did recognize octaves, although musically trained Westerners were better at it than those with no musical training. And so what is exciting here is it highlights the importance of experience and exposure on the human mind. The research is in the journal Current Biology. In an earlier study, Jacoby's colleague Josh McDermott and his team from MIT found that the Chimane don't find it unpleasant to hear notes like C and F sharp played together. But they're a dissonant combo that's particularly grating to many Western ears. Despite the evidence that experience influences pitch perception, biology is also a factor. Jacoby says the new study also revealed that both Westerners and the Chimane have trouble distinguishing between really high notes above 4,000 hertz even though human hearing goes all the way up to 20,000 hertz. And that may be because, no matter where we're from, we hit the limits of our brains before we reach the limits of our ears. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Suzanne Bard. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. Occasional aches and pains are an expected part of life, but for many people, pain is a constant companion. Dr. Chad Helmick is with CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. He's joining us today to discuss ways to manage chronic pain. Welcome to the show, Chad. Thank you. Chad, how many people in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain? In 2016, 50 million adults had chronic pain, which is pain on most or every day in the past six months. More interesting, though, is that 20 million people have high-impact chronic pain, which is chronic pain that also limits their work or life activities on most or every day in the past six months. This is a problem because chronic pain is associated not only with symptoms, but with anxiety and depression, reduced quality of life, and the risk of opioid problems. What are the most common causes of chronic pain? The most common causes generally relate to bones and joints, like low back pain and arthritis, but there are many other causes, headaches, sickle cell disease, fibromyalgia, surgery and injuries, and many, many others. Is chronic pain more common in any particular group of people? Yes, it's, uh, it occurs at all ages, but it's more common in um, older middle-aged adults and in the oldest old, 85 and older. It's also more common in women, poor people, and those who live in rural areas. How is chronic pain treated? Well, the first thing to do is to get a diagnosis, which can help guide treatment. But the thinking about chronic pain now is it becomes a chronic disease by itself, regardless of the cause, and that can cause significant problems. The real goal in management is to have a manageable level of pain, not to get rid of all pain. There are several steps that can be taken, and these are sometimes difficult to do because of barriers to access. But it makes sense to do the simplest and safest things first. And these are non-drug steps, things like physical activity. Walking is perfectly good to help reduce pain. Also, self-management education can give you some confidence in managing chronic pain when you're on your own. There's also physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychological therapy, better sleep, which usually means less alcohol, and seeing a chiropractor or getting biofeedback and massage. If that's not enough, non-opioid drugs like Tylenol or Motrin and Advil or Naproxen or Aleve can help. If those don't work, then it's time to consider something stronger. Sometimes that's opioids, but there's not great evidence that opioids are good for long-term pain in most people. 
Do you have any advice for people suffering from chronic pain? Well, it's important to work with a variety of providers who are working together to help you. Uh, The goal, again, is manageable pain so you can live a productive life. This can include physical therapy, and most people can walk, to treat any underlying depression or anxiety, and to avoid further injuries. Finally, the National Pain Strategy is laying out a strategic roadmap to improve pain management system in this country. Where can listeners get more information about managing chronic pain? Listeners can go to the NIH website, nih.gov, and type in National Pain Strategy. Thanks, Chad. I've been talking today with Dr. Chad Helmick about ways to manage chronic pain. If you're experiencing daily pain, talk with your healthcare provider to ensure you have the correct diagnosis and know how to manage your condition. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Kathleen Dooling for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution, and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots Radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Is President Trump regularly violating the anti-corruption provision of the Constitution called the Emoluments Clause? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. Emolument is a fancy word meaning profit, gain, or compensation. And Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, in sweeping language, prohibits any person who holds a federal office, that includes the president, from profiting from his office, that is, from receiving an emolument. Trump, profiting from the patronage of persons seeking favors from administration, who are at the same time spending huge sums at his hotels, has spawned numerous lawsuits alleging his violation of the Emoluments Clause. The Emoluments Clause case brought in New York federal court initially was thrown out, but recently was reinstated by the Court of Appeals, and that case now proceeds. However, another case with a similar legal claim has been thrown out by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And in the District of Columbia, a very similar case brought by congressional Democrats also is headed to that circuit court. This first ever constitutional controversy may well be headed for the Supreme Court, which may or may not actually make a decision. After all, the high court just decided in the case of blatant partisan gerrymandering that it would not, and no federal court could, fashion any remedy for that corrupt, democracy-destroying practice. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1786. Daniel Shays led a group of farmers in an armed uprising. They were angry about taxes levied by the state of Massachusetts. Shays had been a captain in the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War. After the war, an economic downturn hit farmers hard. During the Revolutionary War, many Massachusetts residents had few assets other than their land. After the war, European businesses refused to extend lines of credit to businesses in Massachusetts. The Europeans insisted on payment of goods in hard cash. Massachusetts businesses, in turn, demanded that their own customers pay with hard cash. Rural farmers could not comply. Farmers began to lose their land when they could not meet their debt and tax obligations. To make matters worse, some soldiers were having a hard time collecting their pay for their military service. When the Massachusetts legislature adjourned without considering the many petitions from those seeking relief from the courts issuing foreclosures, many farmers had had enough. Daniel Shays and others began to organize protests against the harsh economic conditions. 
Daniel Shays and others ended up in court for non-payment of debts. That led Shays and the other farmers in the armed uprising. The rebels shut down the courts. In turn, the Massachusetts legislature passed harsh measures to try and quell the protests. They issued a resolution which allowed authorities to keep people in jail without a trial. Eventually, militia forces suppressed the 4,000 rebels. Some protesters were pardoned. A few escaped to nearby states, with two being sentenced to death by hanging. Daniel Shea hid in the Vermont woods until he was later pardoned. Even before the Industrial Revolution that gave rise to labor unions, agricultural workers faced many hardships. And this is another example of them banding together to fight for change. I read the news today. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Welcome to an early edition of What's News. It's early so I can be in place at 9 a.m. Eastern Time when the acting director of national intelligence, Joseph McGuire, is due to testify before Congress about the whistleblower complaint. We'll cover today's developments on both the Nicole Sandler Show heard on the Progressive Voices Network at 5 Eastern to Pacific, and have another update as I guest host Brad Friedman's broadcast that airs at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. But here's what's happening now. The political ground quaked on Wednesday when the White House released a summary of Donald Trump's July 25th phone call with Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky. Proving his lack of understanding about what being president actually means, Trump expressed disbelief that he could be impeached over this. And the Democrats did this hoax during the United Nations week. It was perfect because this way it takes away from these tremendous achievements that we're taking care of doing, uh, that we're involved in, in New York City at the United Nations. So that was all planned. Like everything else, it was all planned. And the witch hunt continues. But they're getting hit hard on this witch hunt because when they look at the information, it's a joke. Impeachment for that? When you have a wonderful meeting or you have a wonderful phone conversation? I think you should ask. We actually, you know, that was the second conversation. I think you should ask for the first conversation also. I can't believe they haven't. Although I heard there's a there's a rumor out they want the first conversation. But I think you should do that. I think you should do. And I think you should ask for VP Pence's conversation because he had a couple of conversations also. I could save you a lot of time. They were all perfect. Thursday's Washington Post front page screams Trump offered justices aid for a probe of Biden. And in a scathing editorial calls the phone conversation a, quote, devastating indictment of the U.S. president. Donald Trump held a press conference at the U.N. Wednesday afternoon in which he appeared drawn, dejected and defeated. That didn't stop him from rambling as usual. Now, while Trump was speaking, members of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees were in a skiff reading the whistleblower complaint. As they emerged, each one seemed more shaken by what they read than the last. Chuck Schumer said he was, quote, even more worried after reading the document. Eric Swalwell told Wolf Blitzer it is a, quote, five alarm concern, adding it's actually shocking that so many people saw this conduct and didn't come forward. Jackie Spear told Rachel Maddow the complaint is, quote, nothing short of explosive. It is so much more than the summary of the telephone call that has been presented by the White House. And Republican Senator Ben Sass warned fellow Republicans that, quote, they ought not to be rushing to circle the wagons, given there's obviously lots that's very troubling in the report. House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff emerged from the skiff and went right to the microphones. There was only one message that that president of Ukraine got from that call, and that was, this is what I need. I know what you need. Like any mafia boss, the president didn't need to say, That's a nice country you have. It'd be a shame if something happened to it, because that was clear from the conversation. There is no quid pro quo necessary to betray your country or your oath of office, Uh, even though many read this as a quid pro quo. uh, I'm not concerned whether it is a quid pro quo or not. Ukraine understood what this president wanted. He made it abundantly clear. He made it redundantly clear. He had his emissaries making it clear. And Ukraine knew what it needed to do if it wanted to get military assistance. 
and that is help the President of the United States violate his oath of office. And late Wednesday afternoon came word that the whistleblower complaint has been declassified. A link at which we can read it should be available Thursday morning, most likely before 9 a.m. Eastern. That's when Joseph McGuire, the acting director of national intelligence, will be on Capitol Hill testifying in an open setting. All the networks and all the cable news channels will be covering it. What a difference a day makes. We watched as the whip count of House Democrats supporting an impeachment inquiry rose exponentially in the course of a day or two. Now virtually all news outlets are reporting that the number has passed the 218 necessary. Those who've already read the whistleblower complaint stress that the July 25th phone call was just one part of a much larger and much more devastating story. The New York Times reporting that, quote, the whistleblower identified multiple White House officials as witnesses to potential presidential misconduct who could corroborate the complaint, adding that the inspector general for the intelligence community, Michael Atkinson, interviewed witnesses. And CNN reports that there's a tentative deal in place for the whistleblower to testify on the condition that the appropriate security clearances are given for the whistleblower's attorneys to attend. And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. For updates on this story, be sure to tune in to The Nicole Sandler Show this afternoon at 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific, and to the broadcast, which I'm guest hosting again tonight, at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, here on the Progressive Voices Network. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 55 degrees Fahrenheit slated for a high of about 82 Sunny conditions are currently in play and will continue so throughout the day. It looks like we'll uh, have light and variable winds and all day and into the night with an overnight low in the mid-50s and then partly cloudy skies tomorrow and uh, with a high dropping down to around 70. How dare they? Because winds will then be picking up out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Bringing in quite a bit of rain with thunderstorms on Saturday. At least that's the forecast. Indeed. Uh, Ragweed pollen is low. The air quality index is at 31 parts per million in the good range. For those of you who can breathe well. And the daytime UV index is moderate at 5. Barometric pressure is rising at 29.98 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 70%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. London is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 70 degrees and cloudy. Rome is 81 degrees and fair. Kiev is 52 degrees with a light rain. Kabul is 80 degrees and fair. Hong Kong is 78 degrees and clear. Tokyo is 71 degrees and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 63 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 62 and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 73 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. 
and these people positively live around the world. Abdul Qadir Siddiqui and Storey Karimi of Reuters bring us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Afghan women's rights activists have demanded the authorities lift a requirement that all voters be photographed at polling station in Saturday's presidential election, arguing that it could prevent hundreds of thousands of women from voting. Afghanistan's electoral authorities have decided to photograph all voters using facial recognition software as an anti-fraud measure after elections in 2009 and 2014 ended in disputes over rampant ballot stuffing. Maybe they were being stuffed behind the curtain. Maybe. But the photo requirement could be particularly difficult for women, especially in conservative areas where most adult women and older girls cover their faces outside the home and do not show themselves to men who are not their relatives. The Election Commission says that women voters can have their pictures taken by female election staff, but it acknowledges that at least 1,450 of the nearly 30,000 polling stations employ no women. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Mexican state of Oaxaca approved a bill to legalize abortion, making it only the second region of the predominantly Roman Catholic country after Mexico City to permit the procedure. Amid raucous shouts of protest from opponents, the local Congress voted by 24 lawmakers in favor to 10 against to allow abortions during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy in Oaxaca, a southern state that has long been among Mexico's poorest. The state Congress is dominated by the leftist national regeneration movement of President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who has avoided taking a clear stand on abortion. Approval of the measure came just a few days after Lopez Obrador sent a bill to the federal Congress that would grant an amnesty to women serving jail terms for abortion. Outside of the Mexican capital, which legalized abortion in 2007, the procedure has been illegal in all states until now, except under certain circumstances, such as rape. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know that Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on, and we're going to meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TL, des photos de bord de mer, de mon 
jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Les années passent, qu'il est loin, là je tombe. Nul ne peut nous entendre. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster, revoir un latte coël. Je voudrais toujours te plaire. Je n'ai pas terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui courent Je n'en peux plus de retendre Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 